Hello Year 10, this is Mr. Solly here. I hope you're all doing well at home. I'm going to be taking you through today's lesson, which is going to focus on building our impressions of one of the most interesting characters in Macbeth, Lady Macbeth. In today's lesson, we're going to be doing a series of work which is all leading towards you being able to answer this question. How is Lady Macbeth presented in her soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 5? To do this, we're going to watch the scene in full. We're then going to read through key parts of that scene really carefully so that you understand exactly what's said. We're then going to zoom in a little bit further on some important quotes from her soliloquy, and you're going to be practicing your ability to look very closely at language choices by Shakespeare and explain what that tells you about Lady Macbeth. Then we're going to rewind a little bit and recap some of the context knowledge that you went through with Mrs. Moulton week one. I'm going to remind you of some of this context and you're going to be thinking about how that helps us to interpret Lady Macbeth and how an audience might be responding to her. Finally, you're going to write the paragraph answering the question, how is Lady Macbeth presented in her soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 5? Before we watch the scene, I'm going to quickly talk through where we are in the play by the time we get to scene five and then summarise what happens in the scene. This means that when you watch the film, you're going to know exactly what's going on. So when we start off the play, we have a very brief scene that introduces the witches. We just understand from this that the witches are probably up to no good, and that they certainly have intentions for Macbeth, who they're going to meet after the battle. Then in scene two, we meet the Scottish King Duncan, and he hears the news that his generals, Macbeth and Banquo, have bravely defeated not one, but two separate invading armies. After this, we meet Macbeth directly for the first time with his general Banquo. And they encounter the witches, as they intended, on the moor after the battle. They prophesy that Macbeth will be made the Thane of Cawdor, a Thane being a nobleman or sort of lord in Scotland. And eventually Macbeth will be made the King of Scotland. It's important to remember that Banquo receives prophecies as well. He's told that while he won't be king himself, his children will be kings. And that will be really important later on. The witches then vanish, showing their supernatural powers, and some of King Duncan's men come instead. They tell Macbeth and Banquo that Macbeth is being named Thane of Cawdor as a reward for his success on the battlefield. So, the first of the witches' prophecies has come true almost immediately for Macbeth. And then finally, we see Macbeth's reaction to this. He is intrigued. He's interested in the possibility that he will be crowned king, but he's actually uncertain about what to expect. And the scene ends with him actually not resolving to do one thing or the other. This leads us into Act 1, Scene 5, and this is where we see Lady Macbeth for the first time. When she's first on stage, she's reading a letter that she has received from Macbeth which is telling her all about his new title and the meeting with the witches. This is an interesting detail because it shows how much Macbeth trusts Lady Macbeth. He doesn't talk to anyone else in the play about the witches. And yet here he is after the battle, after meeting the witches, confiding in her. It indicates that he trusts her quite a lot. Lady Macbeth then talks out loud to herself on stage. We call this a soliloquy. She knows Macbeth is ambitious, but she's also afraid that he is too full of the milk of human kindness to actually take the steps necessary to make himself king. She resolves to convince her husband to do whatever is required to seize the crown for himself. And after this, Macbeth himself enters and the two are reunited. Macbeth tells his wife that Duncan will be arriving at their castle and then will plan to depart the next day. But Lady Macbeth instead declares that the king will never see tomorrow and to leave the plan to kill the king entirely to her. 
Scene five is important because it's the first time we meet Lady Macbeth and it allows us to form a really powerful impression of her before anything else happens. And she ends up being an enormous influence on Macbeth during the play, so it's important that we understand why she's acting the way that she is. She's also an interesting character in her own right. In a Jacobean world where women were expected to be seen and not heard, Lady Macbeth is a powerful, confident, and perhaps even frightening figure. We're now going to watch Act 1, Scene 5 in full. We're going to watch an extract of the RSC adaptation of Macbeth. It's actually quite important that when you're watching film versions of Macbeth, you try and watch theatrical productions rather than films, because it will give you a much better understanding of how Shakespeare designed this play to be shown to an audience. As you watch, have a think. What do you think of Lady Macbeth, how she's acting, and how she behaves towards Macbeth? in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest reports, they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king who all hailed me fame of Cordor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hell, king that shall be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou might not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. This have I so good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou might not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Plum thou art, and hold on, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I feel thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst hide, that wouldst thou prove to Wouldst not play for, and yet wouldst strongly win. Thou'st have great love. That which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishes should be undone. How do you do this? That I may pour my spirit in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and messages delayed doth seem to have thee crowned with all. What is your title? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master written, who, were it so, would have been formed for preparation? So please you, it is true. Our fame is coming. What? But one of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his mess. Still intending, he brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse. That croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits, attend on mortal things. Unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse. But no compunctious visitings of nature shape my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it come to my woman's breasts. And take my milk for gall, you mm. murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances 
You wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and call thee in the dunner smoke of hell. That my keen light be not the wound it makes. Your heaven, peep through the blanket of the dark to cry home, home. have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow be. Your face, my friend, is a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eyes, your hands, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower. But be the serpent under. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch. It shall to all our nights and days to come be soon sovereign, sway and master. We will speak first. Only look up clear to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Okay, so having seen the scene. Take a moment to write down what your impressions are of Lady Macbeth. If you didn't follow everything that she said, that's absolutely fine. But write down just a couple of impressions. Pause the video now to give yourself time to do this. We're now going to have a look at some parts of this scene a lot more closely. In the exam, you're not just going to be writing a broad essay about what happens in the play. You're also going to be given an extract of the play and you will be expected to unpack what the Shakespearean language means in a bit more detail. So it is important that when we do this focus on language that you're really focusing and making sure that you understand exactly how the Shakespearean language is being put together. First of all, I'm going to read you the section of the play. Then I'm going to take you through a plain spoken translation. So essentially what this Shakespearean language means. Then we're going to have a think about some ideas. How is Lady Macbeth being presented in this part of the play? So when Lady Macbeth has read the letter, she then starts speaking to herself. This is a soliloquy, which in theatre effectively means that she's speaking out loud to herself and that gives the audience access to her own private thoughts and feelings. We get the sense in soliloquies that characters are off their guard. They're showing you exactly what they're thinking. And what she says is this. Glams thou art, and cordor, and shall be what thou art promised. Yet I do fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst wholly, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. So let's go through this section by section. Lady Macbeth is saying, You are the thane of both Glams and Cordor and you're going to be king, just like you are promised by the witches. Note that she doesn't say foretold or prophecies. She says that it's a promise. But I worry about whether you have what it takes to seize the crown. You are too full of kindness to strike. You want to be powerful and you don't lack ambition. But you don't have the mean streak or the ruthlessness that these sorts of things call for. The things you want to do, you want to do like a good man. You don't want to cheat, and yet you want what doesn't belong to you. 
We would wrongly win, as it says in the text. Then she changes perspective slightly. Hurry home so I can persuade you and talk you out of whatever is keeping you from going after the crown. After all, both fate and witchcraft, the metaphysical aid, both seem to want you to be king. So take a moment now and pause the video to allow yourself to write down some ideas. I'd like you to write down between three and five ideas for how Lady Macbeth is being presented here. Pause the video to give yourself some time to do this. So now I'm just going to talk through a few things that you could have said if you're thinking about how Lady Macbeth is presented in this section. First of all, she seems to come across as extremely ambitious. In fact, that runs through all of the scene, her huge amounts of ambition and her lust for power. And she also seems very, very confident about her and Macbeth's ability to get what they want. She uses this word shall, this modal verb. She's not saying it might be nice if we're king. She's saying we shall be. It is something which will be. And that shows you her confidence. Also, as I mentioned earlier, she uses this word promised. That seems to suggest that she feels like the Scottish throne is now something which is owed to Macbeth in some way, which isn't really what the witch has said at all. The only thing that she is uncertain about is Macbeth. She says that she fears his nature, is too full of kindness to get what he wants. So she shows her, her uncertainty about her husband, but she's also showing her ruthless streak here. She thinks it's actually possible to be too kind, and that actually we need to be willing to go a bit further to get what we want. She also is quite accepting and clear-sighted, almost pragmatic in this scene. She accepts the need to do evil to achieve things. And in that way, she's not a hypocrite like Macbeth. She says that Macbeth is a little bit hypocritical. He wants to do things in a holy way, but he also wants to win. Whereas she is actually quite clear-sighted. She understands that you need the illness to attend ambition. You need to be able to do things that you know is wrong to be able to get what you want. There's also a hint here that Lady Macbeth is maybe a little bit witch-like. When she starts talking about pouring my spirits in thine ear, she sounds a little bit like the witches from the first and the third scenes. And that's interesting because it shows that she seems to feel that she's a powerful person in some way. She's extremely persuasive and she has influence over Macbeth and she's going to use that influence. She's going to use the valor of my tongue to persuade him to kill Duncan. It's really interesting that she sounds a little bit like the witches here because the witches are explicitly presented as an evil influence on Macbeth. And the suggestion here is that Lady Macbeth is also going to be an extremely bad influence on him. Next, let's have a look at a little bit later on in the scene. This is her speech just before Macbeth comes in. So she's not reading the letter anymore. Instead, she's still in a soliloquy. She's talking out loud about what she's going to have to do to persuade Macbeth to act. And she says, the raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milkful gall, you murdering ministers, 
Whatever in your sightless substances, you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pull thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark, to cry, hold, hold. So again, let's have a look at a translated version of that soliloquy. The messenger is short of breath, like a hoarse raven, as he announces Duncan's entrance into my fortress, where he is going to die, his fatal entrance. Come, you spirits that assist murderous thoughts, make me less like a woman and more like a man, and fill me from head to toe with deadly cruelty. So she's calling on supernatural spirits to help her, to give her more murderous intent. She can then continues, thicken my blood and clog up my veins so I won't feel any remorse, so that no human compassion can stop my evil plan or prevent me from accomplishing it. And she keeps going again. She's still talking to these supernatural spirits. Come to my female breast and turn my mother's milk into poisonous acid, you murdering demons, wherever you hide, invisible and waiting to do evil. Come thick night and cover the world in the darkest smoke of hell so that my sharp knife can't see the wound it cuts open and so heaven can't peep through the darkness and cry no, stop. So just like before, how is Lady Macbeth being presented here? What are our impressions of her? What are we learning about her as a character given she says this? Pause the video for a moment and write down three to five ideas. So let's just go through a th few things that you could have said. Now, Lady Macbeth, again, and similarly to the previous extract, comes across as extremely confident, extremely powerful in this extract. She uses these words, the fatal entrance. She is absolutely certain that she's going to get what she wants here. And there is a huge amount of language here which links to ideas of witchcraft. Shakespeare seems to be trying to make it very clear that Lady Macbeth is a sort of a witch in this scene, that she has a lot of things in common with them. And therefore, this creates the idea in the audience's mind that she is a sort of an evil influence on Macbeth. The way that she repeats this word come when she's addressing these supernatural spirits makes her language seem like some sort of an incantation or a spell or a recital in some way. That repetition has a rhythm to it, which is quite similar to the way that the witches are speaking. She also uses quite a lot of uh, alliteration, the sightless substances, for instance. And also your murdering ministers. So this is another way in which she seems to speak more like the witches than like a nobleman like Macbeth or King Duncan in this play. She's calling directly on these supernatural spirits for help. And what she's essentially asking them to do is to completely transform her into something unnatural or strange. And she sees this as a physical change. She wants to be unsexed, so her feminine sex to be taken away from her. And instead, she wants to be changed. She wants to be filled up to the top of with cruelty and ruthlessness. She's specifically asking these spirits to fill her up with murderous malice so that she has the strength to do her part and to help her husband become king. She sees this as a physical change. She wants to make thick my blood. She wants her any milk in her breast to be turned into acid so that her whole purpose and her whole identity are all about causing damage and violence to Duncan. This is extremely unsettling, shocking stuff. She really is being presented as an evil creature, 
not just because she's willing to do something evil, but because she seems to understand exactly what she's doing. She never says that killing Duncan is a good thing or a justifiable thing. She just seems to be trying to put herself in a place where she can do whatever it takes to get what she wants. In this sense, she comes across as extremely powerful. She's calling on the smokes and the spirits of hell, not heaven. And she's utterly, utterly determined to do the deed to the point that she even imagines herself actually making the wound in Duncan herself. Finally, we're going to look at a last section. This is when Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are seen for the first time on stage together. So the audience at this stage are absolutely wrapped. They've just seen Lady Macbeth give this incredibly shocking, powerful soliloquy. She's just been calling on the demons of hell to help her, to fill her up with evil and cruelty so that she can complete the ambition to put her husband on the throne. From this perspective, you might almost feel a little bit sorry for Macbeth when he walks in because he has no idea what she's just been saying. I think it's also worth us remembering as we read this part of the scene that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth haven't seen each other for a long time. Macbeth has been at war and could possibly not have seen her for some months. So this isn't just a scene where they talk about the witches. This is their reunion. So have a look at the way that they're speaking to each other. What does it show you about their relationship? Lady Macbeth starts, great glams, worthy cordor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he proposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue, Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch. We will speak further. Only look up, clear, to alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Let's have a look at the translated text. Great Thane of Glams, worthy Thane of Cordor, You'll soon be greater than both of those titles once you become king. So Lady Macbeth, despite the fact that she might not have seen Macbeth for quite some time, immediately refers to the prophecies. And she doesn't refer to him in a personal or a loving way. She just immediately calls him by his titles. Macbeth says, my dearest love, Duncan is coming here tonight. So he doesn't immediately respond to what she said, and he is an awful lot more affectionate by calling her his dearest love. And when is he leaving? He plans to leave tomorrow. Then Lady Macbeth breaks in again. That late day will never come. Your face betrays strange feelings, my lord, and people will be able to read it like a book. In order to deceive them, you must appear the way they expect you to look. Greet the king with a welcoming expression in your eyes, your hands and your words. You should look like an innocent flower, but be like the snake that hides underneath the flower. The king is coming and he's got to be taken care of. Let me handle tonight's preparations. So Lady Macbeth here is giving Macbeth some advice. She's telling him how he needs to act and she's taking control of the situation. Let me handle what we're going to do. To which Macbeth just says, we will speak about this further. You should project a peaceful mood because if you look troubled, you will arouse suspicion. Leave all the rest to me. OK, last time. How is Lady Macbeth being presented in this section? Again, you're looking to write down three to five ideas. Give yourself time to do this by pausing the video now.
OK, so finally, we're going to go through what you could have said about this section of the text. So Lady Macbeth seems incredibly focused. She's completely focused on her ambition. She doesn't talk about her relationship with Macbeth. She doesn't ask how he is. She's not in any way compassionate or affectionate towards him. She just talks about his titles and about what might happen next. So from that perspective, it seems like it's a slightly one sided relationship because it only seems like Macbeth is being affectionate or loving in the way we might expect a married couple to be. Lady Macbeth is all about the business. She's also hugely dominating. Look at how much she speaks compared to Macbeth. It looks very much like she's the one in control here. She's also enormously imperious, imperious and authoritative here. She is telling him what to do. She's instructing him almost like a teacher. She shows her confidence again, using that modal verb shall again. And then she gives him a series of instructions. Look like the time, bear welcome in your eye. She's telling him how to act. She's not suggesting, she's telling him. She again seems to be the one who's in charge. She is also quite controlling. The fact that she says this business will be in my dispatch. Leave all the rest to me. This is all about her taking charge, taking control. And she also seems controlling in the fact that she purports to understand him completely. She says, your face, my thane, is a book that other people are going to be able to read. So she's not just telling him what she's going to do. She's telling him exactly who he is and how he appears. She seems completely domineering here. We need to see also that Macbeth doesn't actually respond to what she says. He just says, we're going to speak further. We're going to speak about this again. He's actually completely non-committal. And depending on how the person directing this play wants to do it, he could seem very happy with what she's saying, or perhaps he could seem very suspicious or even shocked by her willingness to kill Duncan. But she completely ignores his response and she just carries on instructing him. Only look up clear to alter favour ever is to fear. She's still giving him instructions, despite the fact that he hasn't in any way agreed to what she's saying. And again, finishes the scene by making complete control. Leave all the rest to me. So if we're having a look at this as an example of Lady Macbeth and Macbeth's relationship, we have to ask ourselves, why is Lady Macbeth actually asking him this? Why is she acting in this way? Is she doing this because she knows him so well that she knows that he's going to want to be ambitious, that she knows what he really wants? Or is it because she just thinks he's too weak to decide for himself, to know what the best thing to do is? Either way, Lady Macbeth seems to be acting quite oddly. Remember that Macbeth is one of the most powerful and successful generals in Scotland at this point. He's a soldier, he's a seasoned warmonger, and yet she's apparently the one who's in charge when it comes to their personal relationship. So, by now, you should have a pretty clear idea of what Lady Macbeth says and does in scene five. And you should have some detailed notes about how she is presented in front of you. Now, we're going to zoom in on three key quotes. This is building your ability to closely examine the language that these characters use in order to explain them. This is your first one. When Lady Macbeth says, I fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness. So now you need to zoom really closely into specific words and phrases and techniques. How is Lady Macbeth being presented in this quote? Pause the video for a second and write down two or three ideas, zooming on specific words and explain why that word or that technique is presenting Lady Macbeth in a particular way. So let's just have a look at what you could have said here. You could have zoomed in on that word fear, the verb. 
This is perhaps showing that Lady Macbeth is afraid that Macbeth's character, his virtues, will spoil her plans. This may be, makes the audience wonder how well she understands him. And also, isn't it strange or even paradoxical to fear something like kindness, to be afraid of something which is so clearly good? It seems to be telling us something about Lady Macbeth's personality here. Perhaps that she is evil herself, but also perhaps because she just doesn't value those sorts of virtues like kindness. She also uses the word is. She says that his nature is too full of the milk of human kindness. She phrases it as if it is a statement of fact. And as a result, she is demonstrating that she believes to understand him fully. We get to decide whether or not that is actually true. She also uses the adverb to, to be too full of kindness. She believes that Macbeth has too much kindness in him, and as a result is revealing her own ruthless nature. She, it's also interesting that when she's saying that he's too full of kindness, she says that he's too full of the milk of human kindness. The, the noun milk is actually associated with feminine instincts, with the nurtural care that a mother would give to a young child. She seems to be directly feminizing Macbeth, associating him with female qualities rather than male qualities. And that will come up a lot later in the play as well. Finally, we need to be thinking about the fact that this is a soliloquy. It's giving access to Lady Macbeth's private thoughts, and as a result, she's revealing her true nature when she speaks like this on stage. She appears judgmental, very critical of her husband, and very controlling of him. And these are impressions which are repeated over and over again across separate quotes. So Shakespeare seems to be really intending for us to have this impression of her at this stage. This is your second quote. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear. So again, you're looking to answer the question, how is Lady Macbeth being presented in this quote? Write down two or three ideas that zoom in on specific language choice and then explain what this is showing you. You've seen an example now, so have a go for yourself. Pause the video to give yourself some time to write. Here are a few ideas for what you could have said for this. Hi thee hither. This is an alliterative phrase. Notice the repetition of the H's in hi and hither. Also, there's a little bit of assonance with the repetition of these E sounds. This makes her language quite similar to the witches. We've also got this verb to pour, to pour my spirits. This is an action that suggests that she is metaphorically going to fill him up with all of her emotions and her ruthless nature. This is quite an aggressive action, perhaps, the idea of pouring yourself into somebody else, maybe not completely consensually. And it also gives the general image of a flood of words and persuasive language, which is going to be filling him up to the brim and manipulating him into doing whatever it is that she wants. The word spirits, a noun, could refer to her emotions or her slightly ruthless nature, but it also has supernatural connotations, the idea of an evil spirit perhaps linking her back to the witches. And then finally, to, she's going to be pouring her spirits into his ear. This makes it clear that she's intending to manipulate and control him using words, using language that he is going to hear. This is where the root of Lady Macbeth's power is. She's not a soldier, but she is going to be able to persuade and control her husband's soldier using words. As a result, Lady Macbeth appears to be very controlling in this quote, extremely manipulative and also enormously powerful. This is your third quote, the valour of my tongue. Again, how is Lady Macbeth being presented in this quote? Write down two or three ideas focusing on the language and what this suggests about Lady Macbeth. 
pause the video to give you some, tough, some time to do this. So here are a few things that you could have talked about. First of all, there's that word valour, which means courage or bravery. Macbeth, remember, is admired and rewarded in the first scenes of the play for his bravery in battle. But Lady Macbeth's use of the word valour here, referring to herself, means that she also sees herself as brave. The word tongue shows us why. She is using words, not warfare, to demonstrate her bravery. Lady Macbeth seems to believe that by using words to persuade Macbeth to act against his nature, she is being brave, which leads us to think, does she see this as a noble cause? Or does she see it perhaps as bravery because she's willing to risk all to further her ambition? Lady Macbeth here therefore appears hugely proud. She's proud of her ability to manipulate Macbeth and also enormously confident. This is something that she will achieve for Macbeth and for her to gain them the Scottish throne. We're now going to move on and we're going to think about the context of Macbeth. So as I mentioned previously, you had a look at a lot of context information in week one with Mrs. Malt. And this is all background information, which is designed essentially to help you understand what is in Macbeth and why, and to unpack a few more meanings there. After I've explained all of this, you're going to be writing down how this information might affect the audience's response to Lady Macbeth. So we always need to be thinking when it comes to context information of why it's useful. How does that actually change your understanding of the characters in the play? We're going to look at three different kinds of context. Firstly, we're going to look at Machiavellianism, then the norms of Jacobean society, and then the role of women in Jacobean society. And at each stage, I want you to be making notes. How did these pieces of information link to Lady Macbeth and what we've seen her say and do so far? So, Machiavellianism. Machiavelli, Nico Machiavelli, was an Italian writer and thinking. He was shocking people in Shakespeare's time by writing in favour of the ruthless action that is required to gain and protect power. To be Machiavellian today means to be cunning, scheming and unscrupulous, especially in politics. Machiavelli believed in the ruthless pursuit of power. He believes that the ends effectively justify the means, that we should be prepared to do great and evil deeds in order to get what we want. In fact, he believed that it was impossible to be both loved and feared. He says, is it better to be loved or feared? One might wish to be both, but they are not met in the same person. That is, someone could choose either to be loved or choose to be feared, but they cannot be both. As a result, if you want to be in power, you need to be willing to give things up, including the love of the people around you. So take a moment, pause quickly. What are the links to Lady Macbeth here? Why is this important information for us to be able to judge her? So what you could have explored there was the fact that Lady Macbeth seems a bit like Machiavelli. She's very cunning. She seems unscrupulous. She's absolutely focused on political power. And she seems to be more interested in gaining power than in perhaps preserving her relationship with Macbeth or even preserving the goodness of her own soul. She calls on hell to help her, which indicates that she cares more about power than ultimately getting into heaven, which in a Christian Shakespearean society would have been an extremely shocking thing to say. Next, let's have a look at Jacobean society. Jacobean society, they believed that there was a hierarchy of social roles, a natural order of being, which allowed society to function properly. 
And this order of nature was effectively designed by God and it put everyone in their proper place. If you didn't stay in your properly assigned place, then society would be out of balance. In fact, all of nature would be out of balance. In this hierarchy, the king is just below God. That means that you should always be faithful and loyal to your king because he's godlike in many different ways. As a result, noblemen were expected to serve their king faithfully and with total loyalty. That links to the chivalric code of honor that you also looked at in week one. This hierarchy, this natural order of affairs that the Jacobeans believed in, meant that treason to kill or plots to harm the king was the worst of all crimes. You had a quick look at Dante's Inferno in week one, and you might remember that treason will place you in the deepest and most awful circle of hell. We can also remember that the Jacobean society was rocked by the gunpowder plot just a few years before this play was written. Shakespeare was certainly thinking about the gunpowder plot when he wrote Macbeth. When Guy Fawkes and the others attempted to blow up Parliament and the King, this was a very recent event in the audience's mind and would have been viewed as a deeply distressing and evil crime against King James I. We need to remember that James I saw Macbeth on stage. It was performed for him and to an extent was written for him. In fact, Macbeth is filled with small references which would have been understood by James I personally. When Lady Macbeth talks about how Macbeth needs to be the innocent flower, but also the serpent underneath it, this is a direct reference because King James I had a medallion made after the gunpowder plot, which showed a flower with a serpent hiding underneath to represent the evil forces in society that might look to overthrow him. Finally, we need to remember that in Jacobean society, there was a widespread pervasive belief in witches, not least by James I himself, who wrote an entire book about witchcraft. Witches were typically women and were felt to have a serious manipulative influence on the world around them, creating storms and undermining people's relationships. So if you haven't already, take a moment, pause the video. What are the links here to what Lady Macbeth says and does? Finally, let's have a look at the role of women in Jacobean society. Women were essentially second class citizens in Jacobean society. They had extremely limited legal powers. For instance, they were forbidden from owning most of their own property. They were essentially seen as inferior to men they had a lot less power and were less respected members of society. They simply weren't seen as important. They were the weaker sex in need of the protection of men. Women wouldn't serve in the army and they wouldn't be expected to take on important roles within society. They were supposed to be protected by the men around them, whether that was your father when you were young or your husband when you were older. Women were expected very much to know their place. They were expected to submit to their husband's wishes. Their husband would have been the head of the household. And it's quite important to realize that that worked both ways. The woman was expected to submit to the husband's wishes, but husbands were also expected to be able to control their wives. Wives and women in general were generally understood to have overwhelming emotions, slightly hysterical even. And husbands were expected to keep those in order to make sure that women understood what they were allowed to do and what they weren't. Part of the reason for this, what is in today's terms, enormously regressive attitude towards women is linked to Christian beliefs. It goes back to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and you would have touched on that in week one. Essentially, Eve is approached by the serpent who says that if she eats from the tree of knowledge, she will become like a god with her new knowledge of the world. And as a result, she allows herself to be tempted into disobedience. And it's that action 
that leads to the crime of original sin. It leads to them being cast out of the Garden of Eden. In a very real way, the Jacobeans believed that the entirety of evil and suffering in the world was originally the fault of a woman. So one last time, pause the video quickly. How does this information link us to Macbeth? Okay, we're now gonna bring that together and start thinking a little bit about an audience response. How does an audience respond to Lady Macbeth in this scene? What I've done here is I've put together a whole range of potential ways that the audience might be responding to Lady Macbeth, given what she does, what she says, how she treats her husband, and what she's intending to do. I'm not saying that all of these words could be used or even appropriate to be used, but it's just to give you an idea of the sorts of responses that an audience might have to someone like Lady Macbeth. What I want you to do is to pause the video and write down five potential answers with a reason. So you might say that an audience is going to be highly suspicious of Lady Macbeth, but you then have to complete that. You need to say why she would, they would be suspicious of Lady Macbeth. And if you can, link it to the context knowledge that we've just gone through. Why would people be responding to Lady Macbeth in any particular way? Pause the video now to give yourself time to do this. So before we move on, I'm just going to take us through a few things that you could have said here. Now, there's all kinds of ways that we can argue that an audience might respond to Lady Macbeth. I'm just giving you a few ideas to show you how we can go about explaining this. So you might be able to argue that Lady Macbeth is a norm that, apologies, you might be able to argue that the audience would be highly critical of Lady Macbeth. They will be sat there in the stalls criticising and judging her. And the reason they would do that is because she is herself an enormously judgmental and aggressive person. She doesn't seem to emotionally respond to her husband. She seems to ignore the way that he's acting. She's very controlling. And as a result, they might be sat in the audience thinking, actually, that they don't like her very much, that they don't agree with the way that she acts. We also might say that the audience is very uneasy about Lady Macbeth very uncomfortable about the way that she comes across on stage. The fact that she is claiming so much power for herself, despite the fact that a Jacobean woman, particularly a woman of her status, should know her place, should be willing to submit to her husband and defer to his opinions. She also rejects her feminine identity. A woman standing on stage, willingly volunteering to have her female sex taken away from her, wanting to be filled up with murder and cruelty and rage. This is something that we really shouldn't be comfortable with. It's certainly not an admirable character, and it makes us quite uncomfortable when we're watching it. We might also be suspicious of Lady Macbeth. We might say that actually, although she seems to be talking in terms of ambition, perhaps we could almost interpret it as caring that she wants her husband to succeed, but she sounds so much like the witches and she might be suspicious that she is going to be an entirely bad and evil influence on Macbeth. But perhaps the response of our audience doesn't have to be entirely negative. I wonder whether we could also argue that actually we might be admiring of Lady Macbeth, or perhaps in some ways we might be impressed or approving of the way that she's acting here. I'm not saying that her decision to try and kill Duncan is laudable or admirable in any way, but she seems so powerful on stage. She's articulate. She's confident in her abilities. She is an extremely powerful female character, and she certainly does have some skills that we might be able to argue are admirable. Finally, we are moving on to our last task. We need to bring everything that we've done together. You're going to write one paragraph that answers this question. How is Lady Macbeth presented in her soliloquy? 
Now, you have everything you need to do this already in your notes. And if there are any things that you think are missing, you can always rewind this video to go back to perhaps the explanation of the soliloquy so that you're really clear about what you're doing. Now, I only want you to write one paragraph. You're not going to be able to write everything about Lady Macbeth and how she's presented here. And we've covered a lot of ground. I just want you to choose one clear point about how Lady Macbeth is presented. So perhaps you say that she's presented as evil. Perhaps you say that she's presented as ambitious or any one of the other many ideas that we've suggested through this presentation. So you start with your clear point and then you use at least one quote to back this up. You need to zoom in on that quote and explain the effect of the language used in those quotes. What do those specific words tell you about what Lady Macbeth is like? And then have a think about how the audience is responding to Lady Macbeth in her soliloquy. That links to the last activity we've been doing and allows you to think a bit more generally about how she's coming across to the audience and what your impressions of her character are. Have fun with it. If you've got any questions, you can come back to me or you can come back to your English teacher. Otherwise, good luck and we will follow up with your next lesson in a couple of days.